Psalms 119, 147 says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of night that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord. According to your justice, give me life. Lord, we come before you tonight and we, um, Lord, we want to have that heart. Lord, a, a heart that rises before dawn, that, that cries out for you, that um, seeks you diligently. Lord, I pray that you would give us um, that mindset, Lord, as, as your foot soldiers. Lord, that you would speak tonight through your word and your name. Amen. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 tonight. We're going to be looking at um, the life of Jesus just a quick little snippet of it. Um, just to give you some background um, on just the starting of the book of Mark until now, what we're going to pick up at. Um, the book of Mark was Peter's account of Jesus um, through his earthly ministry, um, but through uh, Mark's writing. Uh, he was relaying it to him, and he was writing it. So it's, it's a, I love this book because it's a book of action. It's, it's not only a book of action, but a book of, um, you know, when you picture it, it being written by Peter, you know, Peter, he messed up many times. He was at times a coward, and um, other times he was, he was uh, too zealous, and just kind of a, kind of like us, right? <laughs> Kind of like me, I identify like with him a lot because he is a mess up, and um, I love that Christ redeemed him in the in this way. So that's the book of Mark, and, and we'll we'll get a little bit into um, just chapter one, just kind of glance over it after we read. So um, chapter two. Verse 1 says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not uh, get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting and questioning in their hearts, What does this man speak like that? Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately and picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that there were, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. What a crazy scenario, right? So just to give you a little overcap on chapter one. Chapter one, it breaks onto the scene. John is preparing the way just like prophecy said he would. Um, John the, bap the baptizer, that is. I, I don't like saying John the Baptist because he wasn't a Baptist. He baptized people. He was a baptizer, right? So that's my own weirdness. So John the baptizer, and then, so Jesus comes on the scene, he's baptized, the Spirit anoints him, and immediately Jesus goes out in verse 12 of chapter 1, and he's tempted. Why is he tempted? Does anybody know? You can shout it out. He's tempted to validate who he said he is. He said he is the Son of Man, he said that he was, he was prepared for that he was going to save the world, and he is validating that through this temptation. He doesn't cave, we know that. He stands strong by com combating uh, Satan with the word of God. So he continues on, and he begins his ministry. Verse 16, he calls his first little group of disciples. He heals a man with an unclean spirit in 21. He, he continues to heal people, and then we're going to get a little bit later on into verse 35 where he preaches in Galilee and, and the whole reason behind him doing that. So then he cleanses a leper. He's, he's, he's going hardcore into this ministry, 100, 100 miles an hour, and then it breaks open in, into chapter 2 with this paralytic. So soon after 
the Lord entered Capernaum, it says there, that, that people gathered. Why did they gather? Because they wanted to see this miracle worker in action, right? Because the reality is when God does something, when Jesus moves in power, people are attracted to it. And so as Christians, we have to ask ourselves, is, are we attractive to the world? Does the world see us and go, they got something I don't have, I want to know what that is. Are we attracting them the way Christ did? I love this book because immediately, boom, we get some uh, application, right? So is the work of God in our lives powerful and attractive to the world? And I love what it says there. Notice right at the end of verse 2, what's it say? And he was preaching the word to them. It doesn't say he was doing acrobatics, right? It doesn't say he was like doing the world's most backflips or whatever. He wasn't doing anything fancy. He was simply preaching the word. And that's why they came. And so if the, if the work of the Lord in your life isn't powerful and attractive to the Lord, that's it. That's all, there's your map. That's all you got to do. You just have to preach the word. All you have to do is share that. But the way to do that is to have that word indwelling in your heart. Amen? Amen. We ought to preach like Jesus did. People want to hear what he has to say. He has an impact on this world. So, I mean, we just read about the paralytic, so I want to set the scene. Picture yourself there. When I read the Bible, I like to picture myself there. It helps me not get distracted. It helps me stay in, in the story and maybe get some little insights that help out. So, so picture yourself there. Set the scene. You're just one of the people in the crowd, right? So it's massive crowd. Capernaum, um, I, I don't know, maybe because like as, as kids, you see pictures of the paralytic being lowered down on like a, by four huge ropes out of this big ceiling and all that. But if you look online at pictures or you go to Israel, you can see that Capernaum is, is a really small um, place. The houses were made out of, of volcanic stone. It, it, it wasn't this um, extravagant thing. And, and the back of your house or the side wall of your house might be the front wall of somebody else's house or whatnot. And it was kind of everything was up against each other. And in Jewish tradition was that, you know, if I got married, I would just build onto my father's house. And so, the, I mean, just little houses and what we call a house, I mean, what they call a house, we would call a room or, you know, like a living room. So it wasn't huge, but it was packed. And all outside of it was packed. And imagine there wasn't a lot going on in Capernaum, I'm sure. And so people are just flooding in to see this Jesus guy at work. What has he got to say? What has he got to do? Why is this such a big thing? So they show up. And I would imagine, you know, it was just quiet. Which is strange because if you fill up this sanctuary on a Sunday morning, it gets pretty loud before service. People are talking, hanging out, fellowshipping. And it's not, you know, 140 people or 150 people max in here at one time. And it can be very loud in here. You can be shouting at a person that's six inches from your face just so they can hear you. But I imagine that at this point, it was, it was you could hear a pin drop. And I think the reason for that is they wanted to see Jesus. You can imagine each door and each little window of the house was probably faces squished together, like trying to hear, you know, trying to get a, to, to hear what Jesus is saying. A huge crowd came simply for that reason. And then you see the four friends in verse three, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So, what a crazy, I mean, okay, so you're in this crowd, right? Hey, move, move. What is going on here? No, I'm not moving. I'm trying to hear. Shh, be quiet back there. You know, excuse me, can we get through? No, you can't get through. Walk on, dude. But notice his four friends here, the friends of this paralytic. Notice what they do. They have fidelity, right? They have loyalty and devotion. They continued to take their friend. It would have been very, very easy for them to say, okay, you know what? Not going to happen today, dude. We, we got to figure something else out. But you know what? They were willing to carry their friend to the feet of Jesus. They were willing to continue. They had loyalty and devotion for him. And there's so many times where, and, and notice it doesn't say how far they carried him 
or how hard it was to get him to that point. It could have been across town. And I don't know if you know about carrying people, but they get heavy. Both physically and spiritually, right? My daughter weighs 25 pounds, and I'm like, kid, you're killing me after 10 minutes. Imagine, this, this is a man, he, and he's still being carried no matter what. People get heavy, and it doesn't matter how far. They had enough fidelity to continue through. The length of the hall shouldn't matter when we're carrying people. And I'm not just talking about physically, obviously. I'm talking about spiritually. When we're trying to bring people to that destination of the feet of Jesus, it should not matter how long the hall is. And it's hard. But the destination is what matters, and that's the feet of Jesus. I think we can all apply that to ourselves. Because you notice these, guys, these four guys had to be pretty selfless, right? They had to be selfless because that's not something a selfish, per, selfish person does. They went out of their way. And it's because they weren't consumed with themselves. And in a society where that is such a big issue, we need to be careful, Christians, not to fall into that trap not to fall into the trap of being so consumed with everyday life. And you may not even try to be selfish in it. Oh, I'm trying to provide for my family, whatever. But don't be so consumed that you can't let God interrupt your day a little bit. And I'm not trying to minimize your problems or what you've got going on, but when you focus on others, your problems tend to kind of take a back seat and not seem as extravagant or troublesome. They kind of just fall prey to being a good Christian in that way. The second thing about them is their fortitude. These men found a way to get to Jesus. They didn't give up. They can't even get to the door. It's crowded. Nobody's letting them in. They can't get to the door. And they could have very easily, this is, they could have said, hey man, we're not bringing you up there. Jesus is, there's a crowd, but they had fidelity. They didn't give up. And there's a lot of times where in a Christian walk, when you can be carrying a friend and you want them to get them to the feet of Jesus and it can get really hard. And you could think these people are not going to see Jesus at any point. They're too far gone. They're a mess, this, that, and the other thing. And I'm so thankful that that wasn't the, the the reality in my life. The people continued to pray. And you know what? For us to sit back and look at our past, whatever it is, and go, man, Jesus saved me from that. That's insane. And look at somebody else and go, they're too far gone. I'm never going to get them to that point. It's a spit in the face to the Holy Spirit. Because if he can save us, he can save them. Who are we to limit that? They didn't give up. I love that about them. I wrote here, if God can save a wretch like me and you, he can save anyone. God doesn't give up on us. How much more should we keep loving and praying for those people who we, care, we say we care about? We want to see them at the throne of Jesus, not burning in hell. And the third thing, notice their faith. It says at the end of verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, what does that tell us? It tells us that it gives off the notion that their faith was tangible, right? It's very evident here. Their faith had substance. Romans, or Paul said in Romans 12, 3, that God has given each man a measure of faith. So I believe we all have faith. And the question is, is, is your faith tangible? Is my faith tangible? James tells us in chapter 2, verse 20, that faith without works is dead. So their faith was made manifest in invisible through their actions. You know, I used to tell the youth group when I would teach them that it's weird to see an orange tree producing apples. It doesn't happen, right? I've never gone up to a palm tree in Hawaii and went, uh, laid it back against it and then an orange fall in my lap because that's not right. That's not how it happens. And it's the same with us. 
Our faith should work out in our lives. It should look like something. Amen? It's crazy when you think about it and, and you look through the Bible and you see just all kinds of um, different examples of that. Even Abraham and all that he was called to do and, and step out in faith in different ways. And he, it says that he was um, made righteous because of the way he worked out his faith in his life. Look at verse five again. There's something else that stands out to me. It says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Anybody see anything weird about that? That's weird to me. Why is that weird? Because the dude had palsy. He couldn't walk. He was in pain. And palsy was, was something that continuously hurt more and more. So he's getting brought through this crowd because he's physically sick. He gets raised up onto this roof because he's physically sick. His friends are tearing apart this roof, which I'm sure that quiet crowd got a little bit loud at that point, especially the homeowner. I'm sure he was pretty vocal when they're tearing up his roof. They lower him down because he's physically ill. And then he gets to the feet of Jesus finally, and he goes, what's he say there? Your sins are forgiven. Okay, what about the palsy? You know what I mean? But I think that the reason we see that is because you see the heart of Jesus and, and through what he does. The heart of Jesus wasn't just to, to heal him physically, but to heal him spiritually. Jesus went beyond the symptoms and went right to the cause because that's the heart of God. He wouldn't heal the body and neglect the soul because that's the heart of God. Jesus wasn't going to remedy a temporal condition and leave the eternal condition untouched because that's the heart of God. This paralytic now at this point has a present eternal assurance of forgiveness looking into the eyes of his creator. And so do we as Christians. Think about that moment, connecting right there with his savior, being forgiven. Imagine those words coming from his lips. And I'm sure Christ didn't just say this because he knew, yeah, this is of first importance. But because the paralytic was face to face with perfection, with God incarnate. And no doubt at this moment, this man like never before recognized his sin and he recognized his guilt. And you can imagine his earthly condition, his palsy took, took a back seat for the moment. Because he then realized this is number one. Up until this point, he has only had other humans to compare himself to. And he sees a difference in, in, in Christ. Looks into the eyes of his per perfect, sinless creator and receives forgiveness and guiltlessness for the first time. What a beautiful moment. All because of the heart of God. Jesus sympathized with the man realizing that the heart of the paralytic was of most importance. And when we understand the depth of our depravity and the need to be healed spiritually, the physical becomes less important like I'm sure it did then. And it fades away. Are we aware of our depravity? If we're saved, every one of us here, we were at one point. We were aware of our depravity and aware of how good God was, right? Don't lose sight of that. I'm not saying, don't take that wrong. Don't, don't think that I'm saying you have to view yourself as a dirty, rotten, wretched sinner 100% of the time. I am a mess, but that's true. But you're also redeemed and washed with the blood of Christ. It's like a healthy mix. It keeps us humble. But we need to remember not to lose sight of that. Verses 6 through 9. Jesus immediately, he's got some naysayers, right? Verse six, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. <laughs> Why does this man speak like that? He is, a bl he is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up, take up your bed and walk. 
I love that it says he perceives in his spirit there in verse six. I think there's something to being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I think that's what it's pointing out there. There's times where you might be going about what you believe God has called you to do in your life and and sharing the gospel, whatever it may be, and you might receive some opposition like Jesus does here. But being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he wasn't caught off guard, but instead it was going to be thwarted because of it. He expected this opposition. And then you see they say there, who can forgive sins but God alone? You know, it's a great question, but it's the wrong motive. You see it coming from them. Jesus had authority, and he proved that in being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He proved that. And he also had authority because he's the one who sinned against. He's the reason for the cross. He came for that. And he's setting that up here. Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's validating that. And that's what he goes on to do. And he says, Rise up and walk. Jesus had the authority to remove his sin, as he will do with his physical ailment, to prove his validity. Verse 9 says, That they may know. I love that. I'm sorry, verse 10, that they may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to, be, to forgive sins. I love that. You see the heart of God here. Because not only in that is he validating it to us and to the people around, but also to the scribes. Almost immediately adapting to that ideology of nobody is too far gone even in their prideful arrogance of what they thought they knew uh, Jesus was supposed to look like, right? 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some uh, count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Picture the scene. Again, this guy, he's so moved by the precious words, your sins are forgiven. Under the influence of the gravity of this statement, your sins are forgiven. Probably blown away. And I may be wrong in this. I might be fetching a little far, but I really think that that guy getting lowered down at the feet of Jesus and Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven you, probably would have been carried out of there and been totally fine. He probably would have been totally happy with that. It probably wouldn't, I mean, he would have probably walked out of there, I truly believe, just fulfilled, happy that his soul is not condemned, even if Jesus didn't fix him physically. I really believe that. And the reason... I believe that is because when you're going through pain like this man was and you know that God's not angry at you, it's a lot easier to endure it. When you're going through trials in your life and you know that God's not punishing you for it, it's a lot easier to go through it because you can rely on him. You're not taking that second guess going, God, is this because of something I did? I truly believe that if all he would have said to him was your sins are forgiven you, it would have been enough for that man. It would have been enough for the paralytic. And that begs the question, is Christ's redemptive, redeeming, soul-saving power enough for us? Is that enough? When we're going through trials and tribulations and things in our life, when we're even being opposed for trying to live like Christ, is that enough for us? Are we okay with being purified like that? And that's something we have to ask ourselves. We have to work that out with fear and trembling. In verse 12, and he arose and he immediately picked up his bed and he went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. So I love that the paralytic never says anything or at least it's not recorded for us. I love that. This dude gets lowered down. He gets saved, 
And then just so God can prove who he is to everybody there, to the scribes and to us, he heals him physically. And then he goes, go home. Pick up your bed and go home. And this dude doesn't say anything, according to Mark or Peter. That's a, that blows my mind. He was just like, oh, oh, all right, yeah. going to just, okay, excuse me. And I love it. That crowd that wouldn't budge for him, that wouldn't let him see Jesus, is now parting so that he can get out. Crazy the way. And, and imagine being those friends. I think they kind of get left out in the story a lot. Imagine the friends at this point. They just went through all that backbreaking labor, lowered him down. He got saved. Yeah, stoked. I like it. And then all of a sudden, he's walking. I think they kind of get left out. And I think that shows us that when we, when we um, follow God's will for our life, when we're serving others, we get blessed. It's, it's, it's akin to like going on a mission trip or, or just serving in Vegas, feeding the homeless or here at the church or whatever it is. I mean, I, I would imagine that those guys at that time think that they're, they feel more blessed than that guy does and vice versa, right? I love that statement there. We never saw anything like this. That statement could not be more true around those who saw the whole scenario. Because once you experience Jesus Christ, you soon realize three important things. Firstly, I'm never going to be the same. Secondly, I have a choice to make. Bow now or bow later. When you're faced with Christ, when you're looking your creator straight in the face, you realize I have a choice to make and I'm never going to be the same no matter what that choice is to bow now or to bow later, it's going to affect me for eternity. And thirdly, I'm never going to be the same. I'm sorry. My life is not, no longer my own. For the person who chooses to bow now, his life is no longer his own. How dare us? We wake up in the morning and walk around this earth as if we don't have a personal relationship with God Almighty. We're all guilty of it. We've all failed in this way, but thankfully his mercies are new every morning, amen? I praise God for that. But church, don't lose that excitement. Think about that paralytic. We've been raised up from that bed. Carry that. I guarantee you he was telling everybody, hey, what happened in there? Oh, let me tell you, right? Be excited about the resurrection that's happened in our lives, so what's the point of this miracle? It says it right there. They were all amazed and glorified God. So if that's your goal, is to glorify God, then you know that you're going to be showing Jesus to people. I also think it was to demonstrate to the scribes and the crowd and, and us, like I said before, that Jesus is who he said he is, and he can forgive sins. Have you let him forgive your sins? Have you kept a short list with God? I think sometimes our idea of sin gets kind of jacked up because we can wake up in the morning and, and we start our day and we, we, we may not necessarily go, oh, you know what? I need to ask for forgiveness of sins because, well, I didn't do anything. I didn't punch anyone in the mouth yesterday. So I was relatively pretty good. You know what I mean? But it's the thoughts, it's the attitudes, it's the little things throughout our day that we need to keep a short list. Asking the Lord to forgive us. It's not just the big things. Are you conscious of your sin? I think that's, that's the big thing here. That man, when he was lowered down at the feet of Jesus, he was aware of his sin. He was aware of his sickness, both physically and spiritually. It's not a popular word anymore, sin. But that's what the gospel's about, right? It's, it, the gospel's the good news. And when, without the bad news, you ain't got no good news. It's just news. Hebrews 9.27 said, It is appointed once for a man to die, and after that comes judgment. There's only one way to God. 
the son of God, the one who healed and redeemed that man that day would eventually find himself agonizing in a garden, begging for another way. But the father said, son, this is my will. And Jesus responds, responds, father, not my will, but your will. Thus he offers us a beautiful trade, right? A beautiful exchange, it's been called. His moral perfection for our sinfulness. Something we're 100% unworthy of. His grace is unreal. So before I go on to the next part, I want to conclude with this saying, this part of the, the sermon and just encourage us all to be the friends that, that fight for the salvation or the Christians that fight for the salvation of our friends and family. Fight for it. Sometimes the close friends that aren't saved, sometimes the family, those are the easiest ones to let it go with. Around the holidays, they're coming up soon. Sometimes that's the easiest time to not bring up Christ. It really can be. I don't want to get into that with them. I haven't seen them all year. I just want to hang out with them. Talk about the good times when we were kids, all that different stuff. This is of more, most importance. When Jesus was faced with it, he directed all his attention at that. Let's be the Christian who is sensitive to the Holy Spirit so that when opposition arises like Jesus, like in Jesus' ministry, we can know that we have an immediate advocate with him. Let's be the Christians who, like Jesus with the scribes, wanted them to know. The ones who were most hard-headed, the ones who were farthest gone, it seemed like, so close, yet so far away, Jesus wanted them to know, let's be those Christians. And let's continue to be excited about Jesus. Let's continue to be excited about our faith and share the, our faith with fidelity and fortitude. Church, we need to be broken continuously. Being broken before Christ is better than bring, being whole outside of Christ. Amen? And I'm sure we, all of us here have experienced to some degree that. And I don't mean when I say church, we got to be broken. I don't mean like, oh, that's convicting because the word of God got open tonight. I'll do what I can about that. That's shallow conviction, if whatever you want to call it. That's not real brokenness. That's a brokenness that allows you to see that and go, yeah, well, I feel bad while I'm doing it at least. Real brokenness is something that allows you to turn from it completely. And I believe the key to that is in Mark 1.38, if you guys want to look with me. I'll let you turn there real quick. The key is to get alone and be with your creator, church. I'm sorry, verse 35. And rising early, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. So Jesus was going about ministry, and he wasn't far into ministry at this point, right? We're still in the first chapter of Mark. But you see him getting alone with God. How important that is. Jesus was a soldier fighting in a war, and before he went off to battle, he went off to talk to his commander-in-chief. What are your plans? How do we go about this? I need battle plans. How often do we view ourselves like that? We are soldiers fighting a war. And before we go to battle, we need to pray. And a battle doesn't mean just a day. A battle can be the things throughout our day. We need to go to the feet of Jesus like the paralytic. Daily, he got before his commander-in-chief, before he ma marched onto the battlefield. Do we get alone? Do we take time? Where is our time going? Before I finish, I finished this message last night, and I had originally planned on just staying in Mark chapter 2. And then I got up today, came to the office, and I opened up my iPad to go through my notes, and half of them were gone, the last half. So I went, Okay. As I'm trying to rewrite and think up what I had last night, because I thought that was the best, you know, I was going to get, 
I kept drawing blanks. I couldn't come up with the same thing. I, I was like, all right, so obviously I'm fighting something. Lord, you want to do something else. What do you want to do? And I believe the Lord laid this on my heart for us today, for us to share, for us to consider this Mark 135, rising very early. You know, our, our country just had a huge awakening, right? Our country is in shambles. This is a godless country for the most part. We need God like never before. And yet Americans are, are more and more and, and just, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to speak for the whole world right now. I want to speak for America at this point. Falling away, not taking their walk seriously. And it's because we're not doing what Jesus did. Not getting up early to be with him. Not starting the day off with him. We're not serious about the word of God. This, is, this might get a little mundane, but I want you to try to focus. I'm, I'm going to read just straight from what I wrote. And some different statistics I, I looked up that broke my heart. And, and hear this with, with these questions. Where's my time going? Do I get alone with God like I should? More than half of Americans think the Bible has too little influence on culture. They see a, normal, a moral decline, yet only five Americans Uh, 5% of Americans read their Bible on a regular basis, according to this survey. Only 77% of Americans think that the the nation's morality is headed downhill. How is that? How can not 100% of people look at our nation and go, moral depravity, it's failing and it's going down fast. Only 77% even recognize the need. According to a new survey from American Bible Society. Yet, we don't read the Bible. Something's got to change. 88% of respondents said they own a Bible. Only 80% of, of those people think, of the 88% think the Bible is sacred. 61% wish they read the Bible more. And the average household has 4.4 Bibles. Yet, we don't read the Bible. Something's got to change. Almost a third of the respondents said the moral decline was a result of people not reading the Bible. Yet we don't read the Bible. Something's got to change. Doug Birdsall, president of the American Bible Society, said he sees the reason for why the Bible is, dis- is, not, is not connecting with people. I see the problem, he says, as an analogy to the obesity problem in America. We have an awful lot of people who realize they're overweight and it's making them sick, but they don't follow a diet. Birdsall said, people realize the Bible has values that would help us in our spiritual health, yet we don't read the Bible. Something's got to change. If these Americans do read, out of this survey, the 57% only read their Bibles four times a year or less. Only 26% of Americans said they read their Bible on a regular basis four or more times a week. Younger people also seem to be moving away from the Bible. 57% of those ages 18 to 28 read their Bibles less than three times a year, if at all. Where does our time go, church? Because that's got to be the reason, right? That's what I hear the most when I talk to Christians. I've used it. I don't have a lot of time. I'm not meeting with God as much as I should. I don't have a lot of time. I work a lot of hours. I this, I that, the other thing. Where does our time go? You have 24 hours to account for every day. Where's your time? Social media and entertainment, this is a big one. On any given day, teens in the United States spend nine hours using media for their enjoyment. Nine hours. According to the report done by Common Sense Media. This includes TV, videos, movies, playing video games, reading, listening to music, checking on social media, and watching pornography. 
Let me just put that nine hours into context for you. For the modern day teenager, that's typically more of the time than they'll spend sleeping. That's more time than they'll spend with their parents. That's more time than they'll spend with their teachers. And that nine hours does not include the time that they use doing schoolwork or at school in front of a screen, entertaining themselves. So what about adults? The average American adult has at least five social media accounts and spends around two hours and 40 minutes browsing daily, accounting for over 38% of the total time spent on the internet. What else is distracting us, church? What's stopping us from getting along with God? There's something that is silently plaguing the church. It's uprooting the church and it's terrible and it's pornography. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the church. I have many men in this church that, and my dad, the same thing, that I have accountability software for their computers and their phones because they are trapped in it. I get reports daily of people's internet viewings because it's that big of an issue. There's industries in fighting porn now because it's that big of an issue in the church too. According to a national survey, we are failing miserably, church. 55% of American Christians look at pornography at least once a month. That's men and women. 35% cheated on their spouses in an extramarital affair. In a joint venture commissioned by a proven men ministry and conducted by the Barna Group, researchers found that 77% of Christian men between the ages of 18 and 30 look at pornography at least monthly. And 36% look at it at least once a day. 32% of these men admit to having an addiction to pornography while 12% think they may. 77% of men ages 31 to 49 said they viewed pornography at work within the past few months at work. While 64% admit to looking at it at least once a month, the Barna survey also shows that 18% of the men addicted to porn are addicted to porn with 8% um, indicating they believe they are suffering from this addiction. And this stat is the most painful. Among born-again, Bible-believing Christians who took the other survey, men and women, 95% say they have looked at pornography, with 54% indicating that they view it, at the very least, on a monthly basis, 44% admitting that they saw it at work within the past three months. 25% of these firm believers confirmed that that they hide their internet browsing history by erasing porn URLs on their computer and electronic devices. Also, about 18% of Christian men in this group of born agains confess that they are addicted to pornography with 9% saying they are hooked on destructive graphic content. For the sake of our sanity, I'll stop reading them. But church, you can see this is an epidemic. And it's kind of quieted within the church. Nobody, it's dirty. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's not fun to talk about pornography and sexual sin. But it's a reality, and it's screwing up the church. We need to stand up and fight this. And the way we fight that is by acting like Christ and getting alone with our Savior every day and making no exception. That two hours and 40 minutes of whatever time on the internet that accounts for almost 30% of, of, of the time we spend on the internet as a whole, that can go away. It won't hurt you. We wonder, I, you know, it, it, it bothers me when... <laughs> We wonder why our country is where it is and we act like this. And I'm not saying like, it's you, it's you, it's you. But I am saying we are part of the problem and if we're not fighting it, we're part of the problem. We're not called to just sit back and do nothing. That's one of the biggest arguments I've had about this last election. How could you vote for that man? Because he's not going to kill babies. And if one kid is saved because we voted that guy in, 
So be it. And if you want to argue with me about it, we can do that later. I don't care. Babies will not be murdered. And I think that if we don't stand up for things like this, we're going to be judged. We wonder why Christians, or or churches around the world are, are shutting down, why they're closing around America. In astronomical rates, churches are shutting down. People are leaving churches. People aren't going to church the same way. There's statistics done, surveys done about this as well. We wonder why Christians aren't serving the church, sharing and giving and loving. We need to stop walking like we don't have the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I mean for me too. There's times where I know that I'm not, I'm not portraying Christ's love. And it's all too often. If we continue to walk like that, we're going to make zero difference for Christ in this world. We're going to have nothing to give him once we stand before his throne. Let's be the change, church. Amen? If Jesus Christ, the son of the one true living God, felt the need to get up early and get away from his ministry that God had called him to, his, God's will for his life, and get with the Father, we should too. And to think that we're above that is insane. And to continue in that is insane. Does anybody know what the de- de- definition of insanity is? To do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Church, we got to change. And the reality is, no matter where you're at in your walk with God, yeah, I get up, I give my 10 minutes. Okay, give more. Deeper. That is the goal. Go deeper with Christ. Go deeper in your walks. Notice, too, that he prayed when it cost him something. It says that he got up very early before it was daylight. That costs something. Jesus has been doing this ministry, dealing with people who we talked about earlier are heavy. And that can drain you. Ministry can drain you spiritually, emotionally, physically. Yet, he gets up early and he meets with the Father. It costs him something to do so. Prayer should not be a matter of personal convenience, but of self-discipline and sacrifice. Maybe this explains why so much of what we do as Christians is ineffective. We're not prayer powerhouses like we should be. And it's funny because if, if you ask the person who we would call a prayer warrior, do you pray enough? They're going to say no. And the person who rarely prays, maybe at a meal or so, they call themselves a Christian. You say, well, do you pray enough? They're going to say no. Because we all realize we need more of God in our lives. We need to commune with him more often. If we're going to be effective for Christ, we need to follow his example, meet with the Father. Jesus was in the cusp of his ministry and was so effective, but he never let anything cloud his vision or get in the way of what he knew was most important, being with his Father. Church, ask yourself, where do my priorities lie? Where does my time go? You're a steward of it. Ask the Lord. And, and change accordingly. And I guarantee you, like those friends that laid that paralytic down and sacrificed, they will, you'll be blessed. We need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Dear Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your grace and, and the way that you uh, continuously um, reach out your hand, Father that you restore us both spiritually and physically. You don't leave us in our helpless state. Father, I pray that we would call out to you. Lord, I pray that the church wouldn't stand idly by and let something come in and ravage it. Lord, that we would fight it with your word, with prayer. Lord, make us a people that are... uh, known as strong soldiers for your, for your sake. Lord, give us diligence, fidelity to meet with you day after day to get the battle plans. We thank you 
for your love and your grace in your name. Amen.